Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, I'm on my favourite website in the world, Cube Koga, because Paldean Fates is going to be legal this weekend. I'm going to Dortmund, I'm playing in the tournament. Should be pretty interesting, I've been exploring with a lot of stuff. I don't know whether I'm going to go risky or going to go pretty safe. I'm uh, up in the air about it still, so going to be down to the wire for my own personal deck choice, but I did want to touch on how archetypes are going to be adapting. Small tweaks for a couple based on the Paldean Fates cards. Let's be honest, there's not a huge amount to take home here, uh, but also just talking about the most recent tweaks in terms of the general metagame and the last few tournaments and whatnot, because I do think that's interesting. So I'm going to touch on pretty much everything you see here uh, in various detail based on how good slash popular I think they are, and also my own preferences as like what I've played and sort of the insights I can give uh, as I've tested. So Charizard Pidgeot, I'm going to be honest, I don't play this deck a huge amount, so the list is still very stock. The only things that I will mention, the tool choice is going to be a big one, right? Sometimes we see the choice belt, which is currently what I'm representing for some extra percentage into your Giratina matchup, where the Radzard becomes a much bigger threat, where you can one-hit your Giratina V-Star. It's even a recycle option, which is cool. Uh, it's also good into Goldengo, which is one of your weirder and more difficult matchups, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, but oftentimes, this choice belt could be a second copy of TM Devolution, which we have seen a decent number of placements with a second copy, which is obviously very good for the mirror. And sometimes we see justified gloves in here as well. Every time you're on Cube Koga, by the way, I'll have the 60 itself, but I also have on the overview some tech inclusions that I'm debating or cards that have been in successful lists previously. So definitely bear those in mind. It's not just take the 60 as red. Obviously, I'm thinking about switching cards here, there, and everywhere uh, with various lists. So the tools is the first debate, and TM Devo is definitely a big card, but this does bring me on to the Charmeleon choice, and I do think Paldean Fates Charmeleon is the best one. I know what you're thinking, this can't knock out Mimikyu, it's going to cause extra headache for you against Snorlax, but Snorlax is very, very much less than 10% in the field, and I think TM Devolution is big in Mirror, which is already going to out-proportion uh, the likelihood of facing Snorlax, but also TM Devo is finding its way into like Lost Boxes and this, that, and the other, because it's just a universally good card against Zard, and having this Flare Veil to protect you from Devo, so at least the Charmeleon stays, uh, the idea being that even if they are getting rid of some of your Candied Mons, you have a Charmeleon sat there, so you can just insta-plonk at least a Charizard back into play, and then you're continuing to swing. So I do think it is valuable and it keeps you sort of up in the game. Obviously TM Devo is still backbreaking. You lose oftentimes your Pidgeot unless you've already appropriately sorted out your hand or already just naturally have Candy or Arvin or whatever in that hand. So it is still going to be a painful situation for you. But I do think this Charmeleon does alleviate that slightly uh, at the very least. So I do think it's the worthy include. Uh, if you really want to still have that answer to Mimikyu, you could play a 1-1 split of the Charmeleon. Also just having a second copy of Charmeleon is kind of fine in general just throughout the game. I think when you play this Charmeleon, your path against Snorlax does change to be aggressive Radzard. Uh, if that is the case, it may be better to go back to a 7-1 split with one rod, seven fire. So you have a situation where you can have a Zard EX powered up, ready to go, but also have Radzard have enough energy to still get a Combustion Blast in. I haven't played enough of this matchup into Snorlax with the new Charmeleon to actually figure all the kinks out, uh, but I do think the Snorlax matchup is already like inherently very, very difficult for this deck, even with one switch in the list, I still think it's a very, very tough one. So if you're saying the Copium uh, Charmeleon is going to be like good enough to beat uh, Snorlax, like sure, if you want, but I think generally this is like a much, much better tech. The other thing that I wanted to touch on was the Lost City seems to be much more worth it now as a, just a fifth stadium bounce in general for the deck, which is naturally good, but also if we are respecting more while, which has been popping up in Lost Zone decks and even some Arceus decks have played more while, so it's that headache card. Yes, I'm playing a Switch in the list as well, but it's still only one out, so ideally you're playing the Switch on a turn, you can also Lost City. You get rid of the more while and say, I hope you're not committing two spaces in your deck list uh, to this tempting trap game plan. At the very least, you also have Iono as well, so if it's against like a Lost Box, you can go for this Switch Lost City, uh, take the knockout on more while whilst reducing their hand size, hopefully down a decent chunk uh, to make it difficult for them. So sometimes they're still going to get over the line if they really 
really want to hard tech Vizard by going the Morwar route rather than the Devo route, uh, but that's just one of those things you have to bear in mind when you are playing a top deck like this. I still think the archetype is really fine. Its matchups are kind of interesting. It's a wide enough field that I think it's solid, beats a lot of stuff, and yeah, still is definitely going to be one of the more popular decks in the room. It had one of its weaker showings for a while in Knoxville, which is kind of interesting. So I do kind of want to see how the format reacts to that. I don't necessarily think there's going to be like an uprising of Mew, because Roaring Moon actually ate up a lot of the meta percentage that Charizard kind of missed out on. But it wouldn't surprise me if Charizard dipped kind of around that 15% threshold in day one play, which is actually quite low for the most popular deck in the room. On to Losso and Giratina then. Some people are still touting this to actually be the real best deck in format. It's made a number of wins now, and it's also got a number of finals, definitely in the more recent weeks. And 60s are basically varying by like one or two card slots at most. There's the question of whether you want to play three or two water energy. At the moment, I have made the concession for two. I've always been a three water stan, but the cards I really want to work into the deck list is both Spiritomb and Avery. I think these are both really, really valuable cards to play in Giratina right now. Spiritomb's going to help out with the uprising of Roaring Moon. Oftentimes, they are very reliant on their Glarimotra's V for their energy switch acceleration, which is a wombo combo they have in the deck. This is also helping one of your dodgier matchups in Mew, which is cool. And every now and then, you can pop this down against Charizard if your board like allows it, I suppose, uh, to try and block some Rotom. It's a really niche one in that case, but it can come up here and there. But for the strength in the Mew matchup and the Moon matchup alone, I think it's certainly worth its space. And I also really like Avery right now. So many archetypes out there are just trying to have the combination of Mana Feed Jirachi and really trying to lock down a lot of your attacking threats. So capitalizing on the fact that basically the only tech cards that Giratina has to worry about right now are these dinky little basic Pokemon that people freely bench against you, you can suddenly just wipe their field. I think really going to be important for the Gardevoir matchup in particular. They're playing both those tech Pokemon quite often right now. We're seeing the Jirachi over the Crest or in addition to Crest in a lot of situations. So I think that Avery is fantastic specifically for Guardi, which I think is going to be in a good spot. Obviously it just won the last tournament and is also enjoying the amount of Roaring Moon that we're seeing in the field. So it wouldn't surprise me that we're going to see some Avery Tinas this weekend. It definitely feels like it's worth the space. And outside of that, it's a really stock 60. And I think that's the way Tina has to be played because as we've already seen, it can be clunky uh, in many, many situations. But we also know that it has this flexibility. It has multiple avenues of making these comeback plays. So the deck is certainly powerful. And I think these are the tech inclusions that are most justified right now. On to Gardevoir then, obviously coming off a big win and having a lot of good placements actually, and also enjoying Roaring Moon sort of re-entering the format. It almost seems like we've gone back in that time capsule to almost like the LATAM era where we saw lots of popularity of Roaring Moon, uh, lots of hype for Gardevoir as well. It feels like we've kind of gone back in that direction. And similarly to that time capsule, I have also cut Screamtail once again. I saw Rowan Steve now do this. I definitely respect their opinion as a Gardevoir player. They've been maining it for a long time. And I really like the logic actually of just going for Jirachi plus Cress. It's going to be even better against the Giratina matchup. It's still very solid in the mirror match. It's generally just a decent utility card. It can be useful against the likes of Charizard. Screamtail is certainly solid as well, but that key threshold of 160 really isn't that deep right now. Yes, it's going to be good against Roaring Moon, but you already have Countercatcher in so many ways that you can capitalize on the low hit point stuff anyway. And yes, it's good against like Maridon as well, but let's be honest, we have to be getting those candy plays off anyway to get going into that game. You're already in that uphill battle. Perhaps the fact that you can just deal with Squawkabilly gets you back into that game a little bit more. You can make those hero counter catch plays, but I do still think this is really low percentage stuff compared to just swinging once again with like a big brainwave and bringing another Gardevoir into the mix. So long story short, I don't think Screamtail is bad, but I am yearning for space in the deck list. I still only play two Red Candy and I really, really, really want to play three. But I think Churro is just that mandatory inclusion. Once again, we've seen more while trapping stuff. We've seen Snorlax in and around. And I think one copy does change your fortunes in both those situations. So I do think it is worthy as an include. It's not only good in these situations. There's other ways that you can clear up your board of multi-prize Pokemon, for example. So there's so many situations where this is big, even with Lost Zone stuff right now, depending on what build it is. So I feel like it's just worthy to play. And I am having to make that space with the Screamtail right now. Previously, I thought Jirachi and Cress were basically taking up the same space, and I do think they double up into the same matchup of Giratina, but Cress is still super versatile, and it still grants you that spread option when required if you are making those counter-catch plays. You just have to be a lot more selective over the targets you're going for 
with this Moonglow reverse. So I don't think Screamtail is bulk by any means, and I do think it's a really, really close call between Cress versus Screamtail, but I think the Jirachi is basically a staple right now with the amount of Tinas around, even though they are going to be playing Avery, I would guess. Uh, but yeah, I think Gardevoir, not in the worst position. I do think it's close into Zard and into Tina. Most games are close with Guardi, honestly, because you're also trying to be this comeback deck. It feels like all the best decks in the format right now have uh, comeback potential, and they're basically fighting off each other with Iodos and Roxanne's and whatnot, which is kind of interesting. VIP or no VIP is still a big question in Gardevoir as well. I don't think it actually grants you that much space because oftentimes I want to put in an extra Artisan, an extra Fog Crystal, sometimes an extra Ultra Ball and Luminion in the list as well. So even if you are converting this Mew into Luminion, I think you're gaining like one space at the very most. And I know I have just been going on about how much I want to fit the Screamtail and the Rare Candy back in the deck list. So sometimes that space is going to be worthwhile, but I do think Battle VIP Pass is still so important. There's still a lot of Greninja threats going on in Giratina. There's also the threat of Roaring Moon playing Water Energy as well, even though it's not the most popular right now. The fact that you could just get completely blown out of the water if they are playing a Greninja package. I think I always have to establish Mana Feet in a lot of matchups now, and I think that's why VIP is still my personal preference choice. I'm once again going pretty stock with the Mew list right now. We've been in this format for a while, so it's not surprising that so many of these lists are like cookie cutter builds, I suppose. But I do think that the Lossity is again worth it right now. There's enough Drapion being teched into stuff in addition to Spiritomb, that I think this is a worthy inclusion. I like the double box. I think it does give you some game into Charizard as well. I think my debate right now is trying to find a space for that third copy of Judge because I do think it's such a powerful weapon in the deck's arsenal. I think if I had to make a space, it would probably honestly be a going down to the three cram. It doesn't feel great, but you're at least subbing it out for a supporter card. So the Cawthorn build is the Roaring Room list that's right in front of you. I think it's proven itself time and time again to be one of the best builds out there, but we have seen the Pokemon catchers start to work their way into the deck list. The logic being, of course, that we are bundling in with our two prizes over and over again, so we want to make sure we're getting our maximum value, trying to take out Pidgeots before we're getting spammed with Ionos, or just trying to get rid of their early V Pokemon for their Forest Hill Stone targets. These are all pretty important factors for Roaring Moon. It's also going to help you capitalize on Giratinas without gouging yourself. Instead, you can use a Calamity Storm, and then it forces them back into another V-Star, so it forces Giratina players to have really strong openings with multiple basics, and as we know, Giratina doesn't always do that. So I think if I'm going to fit anything into the decklist, it's going to be some Pokemon catchers in addition to everything else. I still really like the Judge Iono Palpad package. I think they're both really good supporters. I think it's still really handy against Lost Zone Box. I think it's handy against Gardevoir as well at times. I would just say a couple things here. Spiritomb is a pretty big tech card for this deck, and it obviously helps Collateral Mew at the same time, and Snorlax, and this, that, and the other. Uh, so if you do want to go back up inside account, I think that's also pretty reasonable right now, just to give yourself a little bit more safeguard in situations when this Moltres isn't going to be live. And I also just want to give another nod to the Water Energy package. Even if you are just playing two copies of Water, I think opening that avenue for you is still very viable. It's going to be one of those situations where some players are going to not expect Water, perhaps, if they are looking at stock lists over and over again that are pure dark energy, it opens up this avenue for you to capitalize in these random situations. On to Maridon then, and I actually think Maridon is a sneaky decent play uh, for Dortmund because I'm expecting an uprising of Gardevoir. We know it's Europe, they like to play Gardevoir a little bit more anyway, so I'd already bumped those percentages up by one or two, but I also think that it's just come off a big win, and there's this expectation that there's going to be Roaring Moon in the room, so I feel like Gardevoir's prepped to be like a 12% plus play, which makes Maridon also like justifiable. I know you're pretty shaky into Charizard, but if we incorporate the classic Roaring Moon logic and have the three Pokemon catchers in the deck list, we can do that similar situation where, be it with Iron Hands or be it with a Gusting play, you're going to be initiating the race on a two prize turn, and hopefully with enough generator hits, EXP shares, and your Flaffy, you can weave in Raichu for at least one Charizard KO. And I think that's a super viable strategy. I do really like EXP Share. It's really won me round. I think it allows you to weave in Mew much more effectively. I think it allows you to weave in Raichu obviously much better. So yeah, EXP Share, great card to find. The town stores really help you streamline the list as well. You see, I'm playing the cheeky Pokestop. That's because I am playing the Pokemon Catchers. It's really strange because your ratios don't look that high. Because you're naturally deck thinning your pokes and your energy so quickly with Maridon, your ratios of items actually get quite good in the sort of mid game. So if you do stumble upon this Pokestop, especially because it's going to help you hit Ultra Balls and Vacuums, which are key decloggers for you to just draw more naturally with Mew throughout the game. I think Pokestop could be a 1 slash 2 count as well. I still have one Vacuum in here because I do think it's solid in Mirror against Roaring Moon and a few other situations, as well as being just another path bounce. But I do think possibly 2 Town Stop, 2 Pokestop is worth exploring if you are going down the catch direction. I do think the most aggressive build is going to be the best one for this weekend. This would be the direction that I go down, but I can never really question Path right now. It's still just a really great card in the format. On to Kyogre this also had a fantastic showing in Knoxville. 
I made a few tweaks just based on what uh, Azul was saying on his podcast this week, just uh, flip-flopping Psychic for water, also adding in back the fourth nest ball because it's just so important to get into the game. Morwan's going to continue to be this strange thing where you're really just going to have a call my bluff situation against the Charizard and the Gardevoir players. Your opponent can easily get put into situations where using their Churro, using their Switch are just going to be good plays throughout the game anyway. And just the threat of Morwan, as we've seen, makes players not put down mana fee. And that's incredible when you're playing Radiant Greninja and so many water energy in your list. This is like the most equipped shuriken list out there so yeah it seems really awesome to just have that as a package even if they see one go into the lost zone because there is the threat of double more while because some charizard players play lost city anyway your opponent may have to think differently throughout the entire set so it's going to be an interesting mind game and a cool back and forth for kyoga going forward you do love seeing Moon come into the mix, and there's a number of Giratinas that won't play Manaphy, so I do think there's many ways for you to play around Roxanne the entire game, making this a really good play right now as well. As long as you've got the reps in with Kyogre and you can play this deck proficiently for every round, I think this is a fantastic choice. Most of my weeks of testing have actually gone towards playing uh, some Glasses builds of Lost Zone Box, so I've been trying out Crisis Punch in Sablezard, which we'll get to in a minute, but I've also tried out Crisis Punch in this deck list, very similar to Magnus's most recent 60. I think I've just bumped up an extra right hand in the list it helps you get your iron hands in the mix that little bit more because he really is a hungry hippo where you need to go turn attach right hand gate just to get him in the mix or you need to double gate onto an iron hands which makes resources really tight you have so many ways of just formulating multi-prize turns some of them come in the form of tropius with an uptrade tropius also gains value if there's going to be more roaring moon in the meta game there's mini or helping you out against snorlax and against iron hands so yeah super versatile list and i do think this is the lost zone build that i would gravitate to most going into this weekend Crisis Punch could also make its way into the deck list. We're already playing Town Stores, and it can really make your map quite interesting. Whilst we're on this subject, I have been playing a ton of this Sablezard that also incorporates the Tropius package with one gate and double Raihan, and it has the mini or with one glasses. I think it's a bit cheeky to play one copy, but I do think it's pretty good. I'm also playing one copy of Arvin in the list, which I know looks absolute copium and terrible. I'm sure you've all tried this to be a fifth Colrus, and yes, it can be a roundabout bad fifth Colrus. The main idea being is at least you're getting Vip and at least you're getting into the game a little bit, but in the mid game, this is a really, really strong card. It enables Rod and Gate, and obviously Obviously helps get some key tools as well if you're trying to make your combos happen so it's just improving your outs of hitting this stuff but i also think this is a really critical late game supporter possibly a game ending supporter as well with crisis punch now in the deck arvin to grab crisis punch is a really cool combination because you can grab this alongside counter catcher so you actually can create some really interesting end game scenarios trying to hunt down this card where you are trying to use cram or Ravzard to end your game on your last two prizes on things like giratina v star even pidgeot ex as well has that 280 threshold so the fact that you can just end a game like this Arvin's actually a monster card in the deck I'll be the first to admit there's a lot going on here I've tried no sable I've tried gift energy I've tried all sorts in the list to be honest with you I've tried cleansing gloves in here to push your cram into knockout range into shining arcana gardevoir there's a lot that I have explored here but I do think crisis punch is at least the coolest card from paldean fates and it does open up some really cool end game sequences which weren't available for this step in the past Quickly touching on Snorlax, as we know, you have to be bold, you have to be brave to play this these days because there is so much Lost Box and Giratina, but if you do want to go about it, I do like the double Sydney for Sinnoh. I think it at least gives you a fighting chance and your other matchups are still solid. You are still the boogeyman in the room. You are still this really frustrating deck to go up against and players who don't play perfectly against it just find themselves losing when they really shouldn't. So again, a stock list is kind of my policy right now. That's really the main stuff I wanted to touch on. Rapid Strike, I think, is going to be a pretty poor play going forward. You've already seen this kind of peter out a little bit, but with Roaring Moon doing a lot better, with Snorlax still being a threat with Mew, I think there's just too many matchups that aren't great for Rapid Strike. There was a point in the metagame when Charizard and Tina, if they'd made it up to both being like 17 plus percent of the room, it would be great for Rapid Strike, but there's just too many matchups out there right now that playing a dodge and move deck is a really difficult choice. There was a super kooky list of Entei Valiant that did well at the weekend, and I think I would just run that stock 60. The barrel being the pretty cool innovation so that you don't just get crumbed by Iono, and allows you to play Iono in the deck more effectively. I still think this has quite a narrow matchup spread, but at the very least it doesn't mind seeing more Roaring Moon in the mix, because you have the Radzard and Rod in here to try and reload into it, so you have a good time there, I think. We've got very simple 60s for the Clawth, the Goldengo, and the Chen Pao. Obviously the Pao and the Dengo, they are just trying to have really high item ratios for the Pokestops, and obviously Goldengo still playing all those workers and whatnot, Chen Pao 
with its usual stuff in here as well. And then also Art Gigas has had enough placements that I thought it was worth putting again a fairly stock list. I'm trying Leafy on V-Star as a 1-1 line over the Zashin Psychic package because I think having grass type coverage is kind of okay. I still think it's not amazing and there'll be situations where you don't even use it against Charizard. But I also like the fact that it puts itself naturally out of Giratina's lost impact range. And unlike Zashin, it's not just that easy two prize knockout your opponent can look for. It at least has a slightly higher amount of hit points for them to get through. So that's it for my top tier tweaks. Like I said, it's mostly going to be that subtle set. I do think Charmeleon is worth it right now. I think the Crisis Punch is super interesting. It may be bait, but I've certainly been trying all sorts of different ways to make it work. And it's terrifying to see that both Moon and Maridon could be Pokemon catcher builds now because that gives them all sorts of new win conditions if you're willing to take those coin flips. Check the description down below for these lists. You can export, you can do all sorts uh, on Cube Koga. That's why I love having them on here. Make sure you check the overview as well for potential tech inclusions and whatnot going in the list. And yeah, let me know your thoughts on what you saw today, my discussion overall, and what you're going to be bringing to Dortmund, and if anything really changes with Paldean Fates. I'll hear it all down below. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers.